Hello and welcome to our service here at Tableview United today. It is always wonderful to worship with God's people on earth uh, in this way, in this unique way, um, as we gather with people around the world to worship God today uh, and to give Him glory and honor and praise and thanksgiving uh, for His goodness in our lives. Now we are aware for that in, 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 with that in mind that there are many people who are suffering and struggling, particularly at this point in time in the world. Uh, and so in this moment of worship, we also take time to just be with you in your pain and your suffering, to think of you, to pray for you and to love you in this moment. Uh, and so even if you might not be in a space of joy and thanksgiving, uh, where you might be in a space of longing and pain, be, just know that you are indeed welcome in this moment and that we will be praying with each other and caring for each other uh, as we worship God together today. Just one quick announcement before we continue with the service. We started an Alpha course last week, an online Alpha course, sadly, because uh, we cannot be meeting in person. There's no in-person Alpha course. But wonderfully, the Alpha guys up in, uh, in, um, in um, England have figured out that you can do Alpha online. And so we are doing an online Alpha course. We've had our first session. Uh, it was really a very special session and, and quite wonderful. Um, and so if you are able to take part, we have a group meeting at 10.30 on a Wednesday morning, every Wednesday until the end of uh, March. Uh, and then we have a group at 7 p.m., if you would like to kind of join the group, please message myself or Jackie and we will get you the link to sign up uh, so that you can indeed be part of this group. Uh, if you are not able to be part of this group, I ask that you please pray for this group as well um, as we just minister with each other and um, learn about God and, and our faith and, and our walk with, with Christ uh, in these next few weeks as we journey through the Alpha Course. Um, and so please be praying for us in this moment. Uh, it would be greatly appreciated. But welcome to worship. It is always, as I said, wonderful to gather with God's people and to worship Him today. Uh, and as always, let us open our service in prayer. And so let us pray. Father God, we give you all the honor and glory and thanks, Lord, knowing that without you, we would not be here right now. That you sent your Son to come and die for us, to restore us, to redeem us. Father, we know that you are actively involved in this world which you created so many thousands and thousands of years ago, Lord God. We thank you that you indeed love us, that you sent your Son, and that you have been involved, Lord. Lord, we thank you that we can come to you as just lowly members of your creation, but come to you as our Father, as our Lord, as our Savior, one who reached down and touched our lives. And so, Lord, the one who created the universe, the one who put the very stars in place and Draw the, drew the line in the sand for where the waves should stop. Lord, we give you honor and glory today, knowing that we in a humble state can approach your wonderful throne. So, Father, bless us in this time as we worship together through singing, through prayer, uh, through hearing your word, through giving, Father, and just be with us in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. And so let us worship God as we sing together. Love to sing your praises. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came.
Hello boys and girls, we have come to the children's talk part of the service. Now, you remember last week I spoke to you about a specific verse in the Bible, John 13 verse 34, which says, or which records a moment where Jesus gave his disciples a commandment. In other words, he told them something that they have to do. And that was to love one another as he has loved them. And so we spoke last week a bit about the love that Jesus had for them. And, and I told you about the word agape and that the love which Jesus had for his disciples is known as agape love. Now that love that Jesus had for his disciples, he has for us too. In other words, he loves us with agape love as well. And we spoke about what agape love is, the fact that it is a sacrificial love, a love that people have done nothing to earn. So that the commandment that Jesus gives the disciples is to love one another as he has loved them. And this is now the very important thing. So we know Jesus loved them. We know how Jesus loves them. We know Jesus loves us and we know how Jesus loves us. And now we have to love each other as well, just like the disciples were told by Jesus to love one another as well. And the key thing is to love the way that Jesus loves us. And so that means we need to love one another. We need to love our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, as many people will call it, or people who know the Lord Jesus and love the Lord Jesus. We need to love each other the same way that Jesus loves us. Now, you remember I spoke and, and said the way that Jesus loves us and, and the kind of most important way that Jesus showed his love for us is by dying on the cross for us and having this moment of sacrifice for us. And so we need to love each other as well as much as Jesus loved us and in the way that Jesus loves us, which means we need to be loving each other in a sacrificial way. We must be willing to give up something of ourselves or from ourselves to show love to one another, uh, just like Jesus did for us by, by giving up his life for us. And so what that means is that sometimes we might need to stand there and say, oh, you know, I really want to do this. But if I do this, I can't love my, my brother or my sister. Um, and so let me not do this. Let me sacrifice this one thing so that I can love. Whether that means um, seeing somebody who's hungry on the side of the road and knowing that you have a sandwich in your bag and saying, I'm going to give up my sandwich. I'm going to give up my chance to eat so that I can love this other person this way. Or, um, you know, I have some money in my piggy bank from um, mom and dad. They might have given me some pocket money. Uh, and I'm going to take some of this pocket money and I'm going to give it away to somebody who needs it more. Even though it's mine and, and I would like it, I'm going to sacrifice it and give it away for somebody who, who needs it more than me. Um, to show love for them. And so this is the type of love that Jesus has for us and that he has told us we should have for others as well. And this is the very important thing about what we believe as Christians, is that we believe we are here to love one another um, and, and understanding what that really, really means to love one another. And so next week, we're going to be carrying on with this verse because it continues. Jesus says, we must love one another as he has loved them. And by this, everyone will know that we are his disciples if we love one another. And so we're going to talk a bit about that next week about how people can see that we follow Jesus purely by the way that we love each other and love others and love ourselves and love Jesus. Um, and so we'll be talking about that next, next week. But the key thing for this week is to know that we must love one another the same way that Jesus loves us with this, what we call agape love, the sacrificial love that they might have done nothing to earn. Um, and then we just love others because we love others. And that's what we as Christians do. And so with that in mind, let us continue to worship God as we sing together. Jesus.
Let us pray. Father, Son, Spirit, we indeed need you every hour. Father, we know that without you we would be dying in this world. But with your grace and your love and your mercy that you have poured out on us, we are indeed able to have life and life in the full. We are able to worship you and adore you. We are able to be called your sons and daughters. And we are able to be co-heirs with Christ. And so, Father, we thank you that we can indeed worship you every single day. Knowing that we need you every single hour. Father, in moments like this where we can spend in your presence, where we can adore this moment to just bask in the presence of yours, Father, we know how far we fall short, how small we are compared to you. And yet for some reason we think we can take our lives into our own hands. And we disobey your commands and your decrees, Father. And we sin and we turn away from you. Holy Spirit, work within us now and bring to mind those times that we have indeed sinned, either knowingly or unknowingly. And work within us to bring us to a point of asking for forgiveness and, and crying out for repentance and saying, Father, forgive us through the power of your Son, Jesus Christ. But Holy Spirit, be with us as we go through this process of actually coming to a point of celebrating, knowing that we are indeed forgiven if we ask for forgiveness, knowing that we are indeed saved and washed clean from our sins, and clothed in righteousness and peace. So Holy Spirit, fill us with your righteousness and your peace and, and your joy, Lord, that we might have forgotten in our moment of sinfulness. Restore to us those things that the evil one has, has taken from us. Father, as we approach your word now, Lord, we pray that you just bless us, that these words that we read come alive to us once again and challenge us and grow us and remind us of you and your love for us and our duty to each other to love one another as well. And so bless us now as we read your word. Holy Spirit, fill us and may these words that are spoken not be mine but be yours. And may they indeed grow us and draw us closer to you. Repair all this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Every now and, get, now and again, there is a question that is asked, what would you want written on your gravestone when you die? The answers vary wildly. Some would want something like, well, he lived. Or others might say, oh, she will be missed. Others would want to be remembered as a beloved mother or a caring husband. When my grandfather passed away on the 4th of December 1999, it was decided to, be, to write beloved husband and father on the gravestone, but at the foot of the grave is written a verse as well. Psalm 91 verse 4, which says, He will cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. For the 20 years that followed my grandfather's passing, my grandmother would miss him every day. In July 2019, we really thought my grandmother was going to pass away. And one day in the hospital, she asked me to read Psalm 91, saying that it was one of her favorite passages in the Bible. I had forgotten about the verse on the grave at this point in time. For a lady who had probably worked through the Bible multiple times in her life, it was saying quite a lot that this passage was one of her favorites. She didn't pass away then, but the Lord finally called her home on the 23rd of April 2020. She was buried in the same grave as my grandfather. At the burial, I looked down and I saw Psalm 91 verse 4 on the grave, and I understood partly why this passage was one of her favorites. So, fittingly, that passage is not only on the grave of my grandfather, but of my grandmother as well, as they are naturally, as I said, buried in the same grave. 
It is an interesting question, however, talking about legacy and, and what one leaves behind. Mortality is something that we all face. Whether we want to or not, we all will die one day. What legacy do we want to leave behind? What will people know about us? What will they remember or celebrate or mourn? Today we look at the first part of the book of Philemon. And let's see what legacy Philemon left behind. How, he was, how was he known to others? Let me quickly preface the reading with this. Philemon at the time of this letter was not dead. He naturally now, 2000 years later, is dead. Um, and that is why we're talking about legacy. But he's very much alive as we read through the letter. And you'll pick that up very quickly. And so we're going to read the first seven verses of the book of Philemon. Philemon chapter, well, there's only one chapter. So Philemon verse 1 to 7 we'll be reading. Hear the word of the Lord. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and fellow worker, also to Epiphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church that meets in your home, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers, because I hear about your love for all of his holy people and your faith in the Lord Jesus. I pray that your partnership with us in the faith may be effective in deepening your understanding of every good thing we share for the sake of Christ. Your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the Lord's people. Friends, God will always bless the reading and the hearing of his word and we thank him for that. Philemon is quite likely the most personal of all of Paul's letters. Although he does address the church that gathers in Philemon's house, the letter itself is mainly aimed towards Philemon. But with that being said, it doesn't stop Paul from starting this letter the way he starts pretty much every other letter of his. He starts off as typical of the letters of the day and not in, in any way unique to Paul, introducing himself and his companions. Interestingly, in every other letter of his, where he introduces himself as Paul, an apostle, or Paul, a servant, the only exception being the letters to the Thessalonians, where he doesn't say anything like that, but instead just writes Paul, Silas, and Timothy. In the letter to Philemon, Paul introduces himself as Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Paul wrote this letter while in prison in Rome, which, if you know Paul's journeys, you will know then that he's never going to leave that city as he will later be executed in Rome. This is not the only letter of his that he wrote while in prison. Philippians is, is, is an example or another example of a prison letter. But this is the only one where he sees fit to formally introduce himself as a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Possibly because he's writing to a friend. Or maybe because he's dropping the appeal to authority in favor of an appeal to symp sympathy and love alone. So listen to me, not because I'm an apostle, but because I am a prisoner of Christ. He also introduces Timothy, one whom Paul had come to love almost as his own child, but who he says is our brother, not just Paul's brother, but the community of Christians he is writing to. Timothy is a brother to all of them. Following the traditions of letter writing of the day, Paul then says to whom he is writing. And he lists three specific people as well as a group. First, he is writing to Philemon, a good friend of Paul's and also a person who is working alongside him and Timothy and the rest of them in the kingdom of God. He also mentions Apphia, who could have been Philemon's wife or just kind of another well-known individual within the church. We're not quite sure. And then finally, there's Archippus, a fellow soldier, possibly, again, 
the the head teacher of the church that is mentioned to meet in the home, or maybe just the son of Philemon and Apphia. We don't really know. However, we do know that the city in which uh, Philemon is based is the city of Colossae. As we see Achippus mentioned in Colossians chapter 4, as well as Anesimus, Philemon's slave, who we'll meet later in this letter. Typical for Paul, but not for the letters of the time, however, is what comes next. The structure of letters of the day were always, you mention the author first, then you mention to who it's been written, and then thirdly, you give greeting. This greeting was almost always the word charein, which is translated as greetings, but comes from the root word which means rejoice. Paul takes a traditional greeting and he plays with it a little bit. Instead of writing Chairein, in this instant he writes Charis. Close enough to the actual word in appearance, but not the same thing. Charis, instead of meaning just greeting, means grace. He follows grace with the word Eirene, which means peace. This greeting is quite unique to Paul, as it not only brings God into the picture of his letters, but it also reflects the kind of dual elements of Paul's personality, that he is a Jew living in a Greek world, as Jews greeted with the word Hashalom, which means are you at peace or are you whole? And so Charis showed not only his relationship with God, but also his role in the Greek world being a slight change from the traditional Greek greeting of the word Chairein, and Eirene shows his Jewish upbringing with reference to Shalom. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, the only ones who can truly actually grant grace and peace. Paul continues and mentions that he always gives thanks to God as he remembers Philemon in his prayers. We know that he is specifically talking about Philemon here as in the Greek, he uses the singular form of you. Meaning he is not referring to the group of people whom he mentioned before, but one specifically and most likely Philemon as he was the first recipient mentioned. And so what is to follow, we know specifically in reference to Philemon. And we're about to find out why Paul gives thanks to the Lord whenever he remembers Philemon in prayer. Paul gives thanks for two very specific reasons. The first one is Philemon's love for God's people. And the second is Philemon's faith in Jesus. The very important thing to note here is the word love. Now, you remember last week, I spoke about the command that Jesus gave his disciples to love one another as the world will know then that they are his disciples if they love one another in the radically different way from which the world loves. The specific love we spoke about is the love called agape love. The type of love that is sacrificial and ex expects nothing in return. The love that Jesus had for his disciples and has for us, the type of love exemplified by Jesus by going to the cross for his creation, sacrificing his very life for everyone and everything, and not expecting anything in return for it, that is agape love. It is out of his faith in his Lord Jesus Christ that Philemon is able to love the people of God and lo and behold, the type of love that Philemon has is the agape love. The very love that Philemon experiences from Jesus himself. The very love modeled for him by God who loved him first. Uh, this is the love that he has for his fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. And so while sitting in prison in Rome... Paul encourages a close friend in not only his relationship with God, but also his relationship with others. Paul continues and 
now instead of commending Philemon, says how he's continuing to pray for him. He may be a good guy, but there's always room for growth. In the case of Philemon, it's that his work alongside Paul and others for the sake of Christ, um, and through this work, that his understanding of every good thing which is shared amongst them is deepened. What exactly is Paul talking about, or what Paul is exactly talking about here, is a little bit uncertain, however. The problem is one very specific word. The word is koinonia, or koinonia, which is translated in the NIV as partnership. The prayer is clearly that Philemon's understanding of Christ and his working in Philemon's life would deepen in understanding. That is obviously what Paul is wanting. The question is, how? How is his understanding of Christ's work in his life going to deepen? And that is where the word koinonia comes into play and where the word holds the key. See a quick note on Bible translations. If you speak two or more languages, you would have already run into this problem at some point in your life. Sometimes when translating a word from one language to another, it is actually not as simple, in, in, in the, it's not actually relatively easy. Because sometimes the word in the original language carries a certain nuance that might be lost in the other language that is being translated to. The example that I love to use in this kind of situation is the word Ubuntu. Most, almost every South African has heard this word and has a very basic understanding of what this word means. Now, try and translate Ubuntu into English. How would you do that? Would you say it's community? Well, yes, but not quite completely. Would you say it's hospitality? Well, again, yes, but not quite. What about service or sacrifice? Yeah, that provides a, a bit of an understanding for people's actions when living in a place of Ubuntu. But it loses the community aspect. You see, it's not always that easy to translate. Well, biblical translations are this, is, has the same concept. I've mentioned agape, but in Greek there are three other words which are translated into one word in English, love. There's agape, which we have covered as sacrificial or unearned love. But then there's also philia, meaning brotherly love. There's eros, meaning intimate or erotic love. And there's dorge, meaning communal love. In English, we just use one word, love. See, it's not always easy translating a Bible passage, particularly when the Bible is seen in some way as one giant love letter to us and all we have is one word to describe it, the word love. Koinonia or Koinonia carries the same problem. The NIV has gone for one type of translation, the word partnership, which Koinonia can mean in the sense of a kind of business partnership. So in working together, may our understanding deepen. The second meaning is fellowship. So that may, uh, so, so may Philemon's understanding deepen as he continues in fellowship with other Christians. The final meaning is an act of sharing, point towards Christian charity or giving or generosity in sharing. In that case, this verse would probably say something like, It is my prayer that your way of, gen of generously sharing and giving away all that you have will lead you more and more deeply into the knowledge of the good things which lead to Christ. This is the translation which William Barclay prefers because it seems to go in line with what we know about Philemon or so far from the letter. And actually, I kind of tend to agree with him. Philemon appears to be a very generous man. And so Paul's prayer that in his generosity, Philemon's faith would grow deeper doesn't seem out of place. That being said, at the beginning, Paul does call Philemon a fellow worker. So translating it with the word partnership, as the NIV does, also doesn't feel out of place either. However you want to look at it, I think it's one of those cases like Ubuntu, that Paul's prayer 
is actually that through his generosity as a result of being a partner in the work of Christ, Philemon's faith would deepen. The final verse for today paints the final part of the picture of who Philemon was for us. Again, Paul references Philemon's love, and again it's Philemon's agape love which Paul is talking about here. His sacrificial, unearned love, which is the thing bringing Paul joy and encouragement. The reason is because Philemon is refreshing the hearts of the Lord's people. Just a fun little thing to point out here is that the Greek literally says the entrails of the saints have been rested. <laughs> this is because the ancient Jews, or for the ancient Jews, the heart wasn't the center of emotion as the modern world sees it, but rather your gut or your intestines. Now, if you think about it, although it sounds gross, if you think about it, if you are nervous, your stomach feels like it is in knots. If you are giddy with love, you feel like you have butterflies in your stomach. Anger rages inside your stomach. For some reason, there appears to be this kind of physical, visceral reaction in our stomach and guts to some sort of emotions. So you can understand why they would say something like, I love you from deep in my bowels. Besides this, we know that the heart is just a physical organ that just pumps blood. It doesn't feel emotions. That happens in our brains. And yet we say things like, I love you with all my heart. Or my heart is uneasy. Or my heart aches. And so Philemon provides the rest for the saints of the Lord. Not only that, he refreshes them. How wonderful is that? When last do you feel like your heart was refreshed? And how did that happen? Because apparently Philemon was gifted with that, to be able to refresh the hearts of the saints. And so we now have an understanding of who Philemon was and the role that he played in the church. He was a friend of Paul's and a fellow worker for Jesus. He had a strong faith in his Lord, which drove him to sacrificially love the people of God and to restore their hearts. And Paul's prayer was that through Philemon's generosity and joint work for God, that his understanding for, good, for the good things from God would deepen. And so the tone is now set for Paul to ask something quite revolutionary of Philemon. And to challenge Philemon in light of all that we have mentioned today. But we're going to cover that next week. If you recall at the beginning of the sermon, I spoke about legacy and what is written on gravestones. I think for Philemon, a very fitting thing to write on, a grave, on his gravestone is something like, He refreshed the hearts of the Lord's people. That line really seems to encompass all that Philemon did. And here's the challenge. What do you think if one of your close friends were to write on your gravestone? What would be written? Would your love for God be mentioned? Or your love for God's people? Would they say how you loved sacrificially? Or would it be a bit more selfish than that? One pointing towards you, mentioning your success, and not pointing to God at all. Let us strive to be remembered as Philemon is remembered. A man who loved God and loved God's people. Amen. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you. We thank you for the example that your son set for us in teaching us how to love and love in a revolutionary way. Father, we pray for ourselves that we indeed are encouraged to love others the way that Jesus loved us. Father, as we hear stories of people like Philemon, may that stoke in us the fire that burns in our hearts to love others sacrificially. To be the one who provides rest and comfort for people's hearts. 
to love your people the way that you love us. Father, as we look forward to next week and as we look to uh, what Paul eventually asks of Philemon, continue to work in us. Continue to help us understand what it is that you're asking us to do and how it is you're asking us to love. So So that we truly can go and love one another the way that you loved us. Bless us, Father God. Perilous in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. And so we continue to worship God as we sing together. for your love for us. We thank you that you indeed loved us to the point that you sent your son and showed physical agape love to us by dying on the cross for us. Father, we just pray for obedience in our own lives to listen to the commandment of our Lord Jesus Christ, to love one another as you have loved us. Father, may we be like Philemon, someone who provided rest and restoration for the hearts of your people who showed love to them just like you showed love to him. Father, we thank you for what we are learning from this book of Philemon, and we just pray that you continue to bless us as we continue to journey through this book, Lord. May you indeed be a challenge for us to hear what you are teaching us so that we can indeed go and think about it and put it into practice, Father. Holy Spirit, we pray for humility on our side to indeed hear what you are telling us to do. Grow in us love, Father God. Grow in us the love that you have for us so that we can go and love others and love our brothers and sisters in Christ the way that you have loved us with this beautiful agape love. Father, with that in mind, we know that there are many who are struggling at the moment. Many who are hurting or in pain, both physical but also emotional and mentally and maybe even spiritually, Lord God. Lord, may we be the ones to come and bring comfort. Use us to bring your peace and your grace in this world, Lord. May we be the ones to come and provide rest and restoration. Lord, use us. And may we be obedient to go when you ask us to. Father, we thank you for your word and for how you grow us and and for this moment to worship you in such a wonderful and special way. Be with us in this week to come. We pray that you bless us in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. And so receive the benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
the love of God our Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, our guide and counsellor, be with us all both now and forevermore. Amen.